Ruth follows the book of Judges because Judges was an age very chaotic, very similar to the age that we live in. And most people feel that the book of Ruth took place in about the time of Gideon. At the time of Gideon, the Midianites and the Malachites were coming at harvest time and they were ravaging the land and there was a famine in the land which caused Naomi, her husband, Elimelech, and their two sons to travel a hundred miles to Moab. We have a map coming right here. They traveled from the city of Bethlehem, hundred miles to Moab to seek relief from the famine. They left with two sons who were unmarried at the time and a husband and wife, they traveled 10 years in the land of Moab. And it was hard living in a foreign land, very hard. And during those 10 years, Elimelech died, and the two sons, they had married Moab, Moabite women, they died as well. So after 10 years, Ruth gets word that the famine is done back in Bethlehem. And it's very dangerous in that culture. It's a male-dominated culture. Very dangerous to live as a widow with her two daughter-in-laws. So they made the 100-mile trip back. It was bittersweet coming back to the town of Bethlehem without their husbands. And no children, no sons were born. So it was just two daughter-in-laws and Naomi. And on the way, Ruth really wanted both daughter-in-laws to return back to Moab. That's where their family was from. That's uh, where they were raised. And Opa did turn back. But, Naomi, but Ruth stayed with Naomi. You remember the famous verse from last week. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. And if you remember last week, Ruth went gleaning out at the harvest time of the barley, and it was no coincidence, it was no luck, it was the providence of God that led her to the field of Boaz, who was a close relative of Elimelech. Ruth worked very hard. She was noticed for how hard she was working in the field. And Boaz noticed her and, and told all the workers, treat her right. Leave extra body for her. In fact, invited Ruth to dinner with uh, him and sent her home with a lot of food. When Ruth reported the news to Naomi, Naomi says, Boaz... He's one of our kinsmen, Redeemer. And if you remember last week, if you look at the overhead, that the kinsman Redeemer, there's three things that he could do back then. He could buy back family land sold in hardship. He could buy back family members sold as slaves. And he could marry a family widow to keep the family line going. This is called a leveret marriage that is talked about in Deuteronomy 25. He didn't have to marry her. If he did it, the next person in line could. But this was to keep the family name going and to protect the widow. You really see God's providential hand in the book of Ruth. You see it everywhere, that God's purposes will be fulfilled, even in dark times. Even in dark, evil, sinful times, God's purposes will be fulfilled. That God cares for all mankind. Here's a widow, Ruth, a widow from a pagan nation, a Moabite, but God cares for and has plans for. What does the Great Commission say? Go and make disciple of all nations. We see that Ruth is faithful. She's working hard. Luke 16, 10. 
Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Sometimes, you know, we're so familiar with the Bible. We're so familiar with this book of Ruth. We know the ending of the book of Ruth. But guess what? Ruth doesn't know the ending of the book of Ruth. She's living in a trial right now. Her husband has died. No kids. She has left her land, has left her family. She has traveled 100 miles with her mother-in-law. She doesn't know how this is going to end. But she is faithful in what she does know. Her family needs food. So she's going to go out in the barley harvest and work as hard. You and I, you may be going through a trial right now. We don't know the whole picture. We don't know what God has planned for us. Now, we, we know the big picture biblically. We do know it's going to turn out okay in the end. We know the ending. But personally, we don't know all the details. So what does God want us to do? Hey, whatever you're doing now, be faithful. Whatever God has revealed to you today, be faithful in what you are doing. If you're faithful in the little, God can trust you with much. So we come to chapters 3 and 4, and what a great foreshadowing. This kinsman redeemer, what a great foreshadowing of our salvation, our great salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Ruth is going through desperate times. Boaz is a Jewish man from Bethlehem that's going to come to her aid. Boaz is a type of a symbol of Christ before Christ came. Because Ruth is desperate. We are desperate in our sin. We sang this morning that he rescues us. He gives us hope when we are desperate. We are slaves to sin and we need someone to rescue us from the penalty of sin. So let's take a look at chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. The, uh, you can look in the NIV version in your Bible or look up ahead here at the screen. One day Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where, you, where you'll be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Floor. Again, she's concerned for security. She knows that Boaz is a kinsman redeemer, a Jewish man from Bethlehem. Do you know any other Jewish men from Bethlehem that could be a kinsman redeemer? I do. And she wants security. You know what? We have security through our kinsman redeemer you know that like the song this world is not my home i'm just a passing through right i've got a lot of security waiting for me i've got eternity of security with a mansion and streets of gold waiting for me so we take a look at verse three naomi says wash put on perfume and get dressed in your best clothes then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. What in the world is this? You know, you're looking back 3,000 years ago, this is strange. This is strange of, uh, advice. But servants often slept at their master's feet in biblical days. Often the master would have a huge garment that a servant could sleep under. But also, if a man ever covered an unmarried woman with part of his garment, that was to marry her. Keep your hands in your Bible. We, we read a verse last week, Ruth 2.12, that says, that says this. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. 
May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Ruth is saying, put yourself under the wings of Yahweh. Yeah. And here, Naomi is telling Ruth right now, I want you to go and put his garment over you in a very symbolic way. Now, Ruth is being very forward here, don't you think? If this is a marriage proposal, she's, I mean, it sort of reminds me of Cheryl after our first date. I mean, it's like, <laughs> Steve, come on, will you marry me? Like, Chill out, Cheryl, chill. <laughs> you know, give us a couple of dates at least. But it's, uh, but this is being very forward. So it says, um, I, will, I will do whatever you say in verse 5, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you, he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of my family. It's very interesting, uh, the corner of the garment in that verse I read from 2.12, wings, in the original language, they're about the same. The wings and the corner of the garment. So you see, this is very, very symbolic. Again, she's being very bold here. It's very interesting that Naomi says, don't approach him until his work has been done. The practice back then, after a long day of work, the owner of the grain would go and sleep by the grain for security reasons, and to protect the product. But Ruth was not to approach her until his work was done. What did Jesus, our kinsman redeemer, what did he say on the cross? It is finished. The work is done. I'm done paying, the sins of the world are paid for in the cross. The debt's been paid in full. It is done. And then his resurrection showed God's approval that the debt was paid in full. And we can approach our kinsman redeemer with confidence. The work has been done. She comes to Boaz and she, she admits, she knows, Ruth knows she's in dire straits. I, I can't save myself. I'm, I'm just a widow. I need a kinsman redeemer. When we come to Jesus Christ, we admit we can't save ourselves. Only you can save us. And we can come to the Lord with confidence. John 6, 37 says this. And this is what Jesus said. All those the Father give me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Do you think Jesus is going to say no to someone when someone comes to him? It's very interesting here as we take a look at verse 10. Boaz says to her, the Lord bless you, my daughter. Remember, there's a big age difference. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which he showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people in my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am the guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if, uh, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good. Let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, 
I will do it. Lie here until morning. You know, it's very interesting. Uh, Boaz had, always, had already thought about this proposal. He's got it already thought out. He knows that there's another relative who's a step closer to the kinsman redeemer than, than he is. But he has already thought it out. And of course, as far as the age difference, you know, we, we, we can understand that. Jesus, our kinsman redeemer, how old is he? <laughs> you know, in John 8, 58, it says, before Abraham was born, I am. And, you know, this man, Boaz, I'm sure being an older man, as far he wasn't as good looking as the younger men that Ruth could have gone for. But when you think of the prophecies about our Lord Jesus Christ in Isaiah 53, 2, it says, He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. When Jesus came to earth in flesh, he was just an ordinary looking person. In fact, people often stumbled because, aren't you the carpenter's son? Don't we know your brothers and your sisters? It wasn't like he had, you know, great looks to attract people to himself. He came in the flesh. Boaz, as our kinsman redeemer, Dwight Pentecost, said this. Number one, he was able. He was able. And number two, he was willing. And he wanted to act quickly. I will redeem you. Take a look at verse 14, chapter 3. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he, um, and he said, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. You know, Boaz was concerned about her reputation and his reputation. And there was nothing sexual here that took place. And he wanted to make sure that there was no appearance of evil. So Ruth left before uh, the morning and people could see them together. Take a look at verse 15. He also said, bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and placed the bundle on her. Then he went back to the town. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, how did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, he gave me the six measures of barley saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty handed. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens. For the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. This is 60 to 95 pounds of barley that she went home with. Some people say it was like a dowry payment in a way. But what does Ephesians 3.20 say? Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. We are so blessed as Christians, but there's more to come. There's more to come. And she told her mother-in-law everything. When we come to Jesus Christ as our kinsman redeemer, we should go out and tell everybody what the Lord has done for us. In verse 18, you know, Naomi says, wait, wait, don't do anything. Wait, let him do his business. That's a beautiful picture of salvation. Because let me tell you, what was your part in your salvation? What, what did you do to earn your salvation? Nothing. Salvation is of God. It is a gift of God. We have nothing to do with it. Going on to chapter 4, there's a big problem. There's, there's a big subplot in this story because there's a kinsman redeemer that's closer than Boaz. Verse 1. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat down there just as the garden redeemer he had mentioned came along. Boaz said, 
come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. It's very interesting, the gates back in those towns, it wasn't just a simple swing open gate. It was a meeting place. Court took place there. Business transactions took place there. There's a lot of cubbies and corridors where people hung out at that time to talk. So he sees this kinsman redeemer that he needs to talk to. Because we are talking about a legal transaction. By the way, at the cross, there was a legal transaction. In fact, we sang about it this morning. There was a debt that had to be paid at the cross. And Jesus Christ paid that debt for us in full. Verse 2, Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, Sit here. And they did so. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Emelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. And the man says, I will redeem it, he said. Boy, can you imagine? Probably your heart sank, or everybody, when you read that. Like, no, no, no. You know, he says, I will redeem it. But take a look at verse 5. Then Boaz says, this is a package deal. Okay, there's a, this is a, there's a package to this. On the day you buy the land from Naomi, you, are also acquire, you also acquire Ruth the Mopite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with the property. There's more involved than just buying land here. If you buy the land, you also have to marry this Mopite woman, this woman. And let me remind you, that when the little babies come, you're going to have to go out, you're going to have to go, you're going to buy a minivan. And you're going to have to go to soccer practices and dance rehearsals. And you're going to have to pay college for them and weddings for them. And when children are born, they actually get Malon, Ruth's husband's last name. And they're, they inherit the land in his name. So the kids you raise will have the last name of Malon, not your last name. And they'll be entitled to, to part of your inheritance. So this man, hmm. Verse 6. At this, the guardian re redeemer said, Then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. This man was ruthless. Let me repeat that again. He was ruthless. It worked better the second time. Okay. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. You know, this man's name is never mentioned in the Bible. It's never mentioned. Some Bible scholars said, well, again, seeing that it symbolizes salvation, this man can represent two people. Mankind can represent religion. Man cannot save, man cannot redeem because he's a sinner. Religion cannot save. Religion cannot redeem. You can't, you can't rely on traditions of the church, church attendance. You can't rely on that. It's only through Jesus Christ that we're saved. Our kinsman, Redeemer. Verse 7. Now, in earlier times in Israel... For the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. 
This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. We do not know the author of the book of Ruth. Some people feel it's, the, it's Samuel. But we do know that the book was written some years later. It was stopped as far as its practice because he had to explain the custom to the audience. But the point is, a sandal was taken off and given to the other person. Like, the property you're buying, you have the right now to walk on the property. This is your property. Here's a sandal. Walk on the property as if it's your property. So this was the transaction that took place here. Nine and hired Ruth the Moabite, Malon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today, you are witnesses. And then we'll continue on verse 11. Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. If you remember right, Jacob had two wives. She also, he also had some of their uh, maidservants. But nine of the tribes of Israel were born to Jacob through Rachel and Leah. It goes on to say, May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. I believe he is famous. We're talking, we're talking about him today 3,000 years later. So I would say he's pretty famous. Through the offspring of the Lord uh, gives you uh, by this young woman, may your family be like of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Of course, that's a whole nother story in the Bible. Tamar had an incestuous relationship with her father-in-law and twins were born. And uh, Perez there's different ways to pronounce it, establish his family in the area of Bethlehem. So the people of the town witnessing are just blessing uh, the couple, blessing Boaz on future children, on his wife, and that the city of Bethlehem be blessed. And as we approach Christmas, especially Micah 5 too, but you Bethlehem, Ephrata, so you are small among the clans of Judah. Out of you will come from me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. So 700 years earlier, this prophecy about the town of Bethlehem. Going back to chapter 4, verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Isn't that interesting? A miracle birth, you can, start, you, you can say, in the city of Bethlehem. Isn't that a great foreshadowing of things to come? And all oh, the, the, the people, the women in town, verse 14, the women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will, um, he will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The woman living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. The women in town just praised God because of this birth. And remember, when Ruth came home the first time, remember what she told the women of the town? Don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. Because she was bitter. 
She was bitter when she returned. She's no longer bitter. And for all the grandpas and grandmas out there, you know what a grandchild can do, how they pull on your heartstrings, and how they tug at your heart. I'll never forget, um, Cheryl, when we, when we fat, met our first grandson for the first time, Judah, uh, not Judah, <laughs> Zane. <laughs> I'm terrible. i got five grandsons. Zane, it, it brought tears to her eyes, didn't it? The first time we met our grandson for the first time in Virginia. And, and grandchildren are like that. And Naomi looked at this little baby, Obed. By the way, the, the name Obed means servant of God. And she was no longer bitter. She looked at that grandson as her own son. And the joy that he brought, and knowing that she had security now through the kinsman redeemer, Boaz, and how the name of her son, Malon, would continue to go on. So God blessed the people, and the people in response blessed God in this whole situation. And then we come to the last part, 18. And you have a genealogy. Now, some people say this is a general, ge general genealogy. There may be some generations missing here. There may or may not be. Some people study the timeline of the storyline of the Bible, and then they connect the genealogy. Sometimes they did that. For example, the Jews always considered themselves the sons of Abraham, that Abraham was their father. Well, Abraham was not their biological father. They refer to him as their father. And in the same way, these genealogies. But this Obed that was born here was the grandfather of King David. It's amazing. The grandfather of King David. But you take a look at this genealogy, and if you, if you were to take, let's say, verse 21, Solomon, the father of Boaz, Boaz, the father of Obed, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David. You know, it's really amazing when you take a look at the genealogy of Jesus, especially when you take a look at the women involved. You had Rahab in the genealogy of Jesus. She was a Canaanite prostitute. You have Tamar, who had an incestuous relationship with her father-in-law. You had Ruth, a Moabite woman from a pagan land. And you have Bathsheba, who committed adultery with David. All these people are in the line of our Messiah, Jesus Christ. God loves sinners. He cares for everyone. We are all sinners, saved by the grace of God. So Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. Because before I was a Christian, I was in despair. I was hopeless. We all were, right? We were slaves to sin. The wages of sin is death. Only one person could make that transaction, pay the debt for our sins, and that's Jesus Christ. I love the verse in 1 Peter chapter 1, 18 and 19. For you know that it is not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. I agree with Job who stands up in Job 19 and says, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end we will stand upon the earth. And we all have, you know, we, we take a look at this, this male family member, this, this kinsman redeemer male, a relative. John 1, 12, Yet to all who received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Romans 8, 17, If we are the children of God, then we are heirs, heirs of God, and co-heirs with Christ. 
If indeed we share in the suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. Hebrews 2.11 tells us that Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. So we do have a relative, a kinsman redeemer, as we're children of God. You know, we combine all these verses together. And yes, you know, Christ, our spiritual brother, has redeemed us from bondage, from sin. And uh, what, a, what a great kinsman redeemer. You know, I, I have a hard time sometimes as a male... I read the Bible, and we even sang about it this morning, about the bride of Christ. And as a male, sometimes I have a hard time, like, with this bride part. It's just me. It's just me. I don't know if any of the guys out there had the same problem. But Ephesians 5.25 describes the church as the bride of Christ. It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. What's Jesus doing right now? He's up there in John, John 14, interceding. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I, I would have told you. But I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be uh, with me, that you may also be where I am. He's preparing a place for us right now. You know, we, we don't have time, but a beautiful study is to take a look at your traditional Jewish wedding and all the different events that took place. And then compare it to the gospel message where a groom would go home and prepare a place, a house. And someday the dad would be part of it. The dad would come to his son and say, son, it's time. Let's go get that bride. It could be in the middle of the night. That one parable, have the oil and the lamps ready. You never know when, he, when he's going to show up. You know, Jesus is up there preparing a place for us right now. And he says, I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back and get you. And just as Naomi received her property back, Again, we look forward to property that we have waiting for us. That's where I love the King James Version with the mansions. We're going to have mansions. We're going to have streets of gold. And you know what? We're not going to have to worry about changing our clocks back because it's going to be light all the time. There's going to be no, no night there. The Lord's going to be the source of our light in heaven. So Ruth is a fitting symbol of every believer and the church. We are redeemed. We are brought into favor with God. We're, we're endowed with riches and privileges as children of God. And we will be exalted like a bride in God's eyes. Not because of what we have done because of what he has done for us. So as Christians, we have a lot to be thankful for this morning, don't we? Not only do we have a lot to be thankful for, we have a lot to look forward to. Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you. I thank you for our kinsman redeemer. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who paid the penalty on the cross. It was free to us, but it wasn't free to you. Your son, you demonstrated your love by sending your son to die on the cross for our sin. So Lord, I thank you. I thank you. Give you praise and honor. We have so much to look forward to. You have given us so much hope. And I pray, Lord, with, with, with everybody's eyes closed, I want to ask this morning, if there's someone here this morning that you're not sure if you're saved or not, today can be your day of salvation. Just, just go to the Lord and say, Lord, I, I'm a sinner. I, I cannot save myself. I'm like Ruth. I cannot save myself. 
The church can't save me. I can't save myself. It's only, it's only Jesus Christ's death on the cross where he died for my sins and rose again. I put my faith and trust in that transaction that he died for my sins. Go to him and, and admit that. Confess your sins. He'll forgive. He, he promises to forgive. He's faithful and a just God and ready to forgive. And again, with all eyes closed, and I'm not going to embarrass anybody, if you're praying that prayer for the first time tonight, I just want to remember you in prayer. Just, just slip your hand up if you're praying that prayer for the first time this morning. Dear Lord, I, I thank you. I thank you, Lord. And uh, I give you all the honor and the praise and the glory for, for all you have done in our lives and will continue to do. We pray this in all of God's people said. Amen. Amen.